Dragi gledalci, dobar dan. Moje ime je Naida Kondurović i imam osobitu čast i zadovoljstvo najaviti svoj današnji razgovor sa jednim od najvećih duhovnih učitelja u svijetu, čije se knjige prevode na preko 30 jezika i prodaju u svim zemljama svijeta. Spiritualnost je vrlo aktuelna tematika današnjice, jer se milioni ljudi u potrazi za sobom i većim smislom života okreću od tradicionalnih religija ka alternativnim duhovnim pravcima. Moj današnji gost je gospodin Neil Donald Walsh. Mr. Neil, good evening and welcome. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you here with me and thank you so much for having the opportunity to talk. I know that it, we, were, we were the only crew who actually got the chance. Well, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to be with you. Thank How may I serve this moment? In life, they say you always get what you're creating and we're constantly creating. So thank you for co-creating this interview with me today. And uh, I want to talk about the conscious creating because you said during the seminar that 98% people are doing 98% of the time they're not doing anything or actually they don't know what they're doing. So why is it so important to set up intention in life? Well, I think that um, everything in the physical world is a package of energy. That's, that's all there really is in, uh, in the entire universe. So when we look at the universe, when we look at the stars, when we look at even our own planet, when we look at everything from the mountains to the birds, to the animals, to the people, all we're really seeing is energy mm -hmm. in a different form. Now that's an important element to, to my answer to your question. Because if everything is really energy, simply vibrating in a different form, if we can learn how to cause the energy of life to vibrate in a particular way, we can produce specific outcomes. And so the spiritual masters of, of all time, mm -hmm. even from biblical days, you know, it was Jesus who said, as you believe it, so will it be done unto you. So all the spiritual masters before Jesus and after Jesus and up till this present day have made a very clear message for humanity. The power of positive thinking is a power that not very many people use or understand. But what it is is, it's adding your energy to the energy that's around you. And it, that process mixes up the energy and creates different physical outcomes than one might um, normally expect, expect yeah. if you simply didn't do anything at all. So the, one of the points that I make in my uh, messages and my lectures around the world is, just as you said, I observe that 98% of the world's people are spending 98% of their time on things that don't matter. Mm. And they're concerned about everything from, is my hair looking okay? To, you know, uh, um, you know is, is the dog all right? These are important things because, you know, your pets are important to you and how you appear is important. But the larger issues of life are, how am I bringing the gift of who I am to the rest of the world in such a way that everyone else will know who they are and we can heal the world's big wound. Because in, until we heal the world's biggest wound, we will never create the kind of life that either we or the world itself would like to experience. Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, you need to believe in order to see and not the other way around. But I think most of the people are actually striving for proofs before they believe. And as you already said, many spiritual masters had many problems with that, including Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha. They, they needed a proof from them so they can believe. So how would you comment on that? Well, I would say your life is proof. You know, m most people uh, are living lives that prove that there is enough of what they need to survive and be happy if they simply change their attitude and change their mind about what they imagine they need to survive and be happy. But even survival is not really the, the uh, ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Most people think that survival is the basic instinct and that we have to really f fight to survive. Uh, and if we can at least survive, then we have at least have won, you know, won that part of the game, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. But you, you know that uh, survival is not the basic instinct. The expression of divinity, what we call in English, the better angels of our nature. That is the 
the fundamental instinct of humanity. And the proof of that is when you see somebody in trouble, if you're walking down the street and you see a, a building on fire, and, and you, well, my goodness, the building's on fire, and you hear a baby crying on the second floor of the building, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't stand there and weigh the odds. What do you think I should do? Should mm -hmm. I go in? Should I, or should I just call you somebody? You don't question that. No, 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 you just run right mm -hmm. in to save the baby. If survival were the fundamental instinct, you'd run the other way. You'd run away from that. So um, the secret of life is to simply understand that every moment is a burning building moment. That every moment is a moment when something is on fire and you have an opportunity to put the fire out and to save someone uh, from those flames if you simply show up in a way that allows you to let them know that they're perfectly okay they have all they need to survive. They have all they really need to be happy. And by the way, I want you to know something. When I say something like that, I'm not saying that, oh, people say, well, it's easy for him to say. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a successful author and he has a nice income. He has a mm -hmm. lovely home. He has a beautiful, you know, uh, uh, life to live. But I spent a year living on the street. Yes, I just wanted to get On this the sidewalk. One. I was a street person. I had nothing. I didn't have any money in my pocket, and I had no food to eat. I had no place to live. I was lying on the sidewalk, um, living on the street for a year. So when I speak of these things, I speak from experience. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking theoretically or hypothetically. I'm talking actually. That even then, what I realized now as I look back on it was I had all I really needed to be perfectly happy if I simply used my time to do what I really came here to do, which was not to survive or not to be successful in my business or not to, you know, get the guy, get the girl, get the car, get the job, get all the stuff that I think I need to be happy. When I began using my life for the real reason that I came here, which was to experience and express the highest version of who I really am. Mm -hmm. Is that a purpose of life? Many people, when I said to them, I'm going to do an interview with Neil, they adore you and they read all of your books. Of course, the most prominent question was always, please ask Neil, what's the purpose of life? And I remember that you talked many times about it during the seminar, of course, in many of your books, that you asked the same question to God when you were on your knees, when you were a homeless person yes. for a year. And you said you had zero, basically. And then you said, okay, just show me the answer. What are the rules of the life? How should I play this game? And what's the purpose of life? And you got extraordinary answer, which is very simple. Yeah, uh, well, well, the answer that I got was, Neil, your life has nothing to do with you. And that's the problem. You think your life is about you. And your life is not about you. It's about everyone whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. But here's the irony. The irony is that when you realize that that's why you're here, to express and experience the highest version you ever had about yourself, that is to place into life through you the divine energy, mm -hmm. the divinity itself that lives in you, mm -hmm. when that becomes your purpose in life, all the things you thought you needed to be happy Dissolved. fall mm -hmm. in on you like mm -hmm. rain from heaven automatically mm -hmm. without effort, mm -hmm. without you even having to do anything. And uh, because everyone really responds to that projection of that energy in an, an extraordinary uh, and wonderful way. So I have learned that uh, in a circular way, your life really is about you in the sense that there's only you. Mm -hmm. See, there's nobody else here, but it's just me looking like everybody else. All of us are one. We're all one. There's nobody else. So all things are one thing. and. In the moment that I understand that you and I are the same entity, simply appearing in different forms, then I begin to treat you differently, mm -hmm. and I begin to see you differently. Because you won't hurt yourself. Of course not. Mm. I won't do anything to you that I wouldn't do to me. And I wouldn't let you go hungry, I wouldn't let you be hurt, I certainly wouldn't want to hurt you deliberately, and I would begin to interact with you in an entirely different way. And certainly you won't attack nobody or drop bombs or 
do hunger or whatever, exploitation and what's ever going on in this chaotic world today. No, and, and the reason that that's going on is because people think they have to do that in order to survive. They don't want to really hurt anybody. People will say, I don't want to hurt anybody, mm -hmm. but I will if I have to, mm -hmm. if I'm required to do it in order to survive. So we have leaders of nations talking about who has the bigger, better missile, who has the bigger, better better bomb. And we and we have people all over the world saying, you know, if, it, if this is what it takes to survive, I will do it. And, and the irony of that is our survival is never in question. We are eternal beings. We always were. And we we are now be. and we always will be. We will live forever. It's not a question of whether we're going to continue living. It's merely a question of in what form and why will we do it. Our life is the answer to the question, why am I alive? And if I choose to be alive in order that my life might bless everyone else whose life I touch, everything changes for me overnight. Why people are nowadays are so ready to choose the negative? Uh, because uh, is it like, like in conversations with God, I wrote this, feeling guilty is a learned response. From whom? From a family? From an angry God who wants us to obey constantly or otherwise we'll go to hell? from society, from, from everyone, almost from the early childhood. Well, that's exactly correct. We have learned since we were very, very small that we either do as we are told or we're going to be in trouble. Mm. And, and uh, to talk about a God who does not punish us, does not judge us, is very revolutionary. Uh, and it's... Um, it, 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 it makes people nervous yeah, indeed. Be, be, because they, they, they're afraid that God will punish them for even thinking, thinking of, about of, of God other in, concepts. in that way. So uh, imagine, you know, imagining a God who is the creator of the universe, the most powerful entity ever there was and ever there will be, is worried about whether one person out of seven billion people is thinking correctly about God, mm -hmm. as, as if a person couldn't even be allowed to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Supposing that everything I'm saying is wrong. Supposing that everything that I have brought to the world is incorrect. Even if that's true, that would, that would mean that one person out of seven and a half billion people made a mistake. Can you imagine God up there saying, we're going to get him. We're going to make him pay for that for the rest of eternity exactly. by putting him in the everlasting fires of hell. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a God who would do that, even if I was wrong. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I mean, we throw ourselves at the mercy of the court in human life. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll just throw myself at the mercy of God and say, you know, maybe I was wrong. You know, yeah. but I didn't hurt anybody. I wasn't trying to make anybody, make anybody's life miserable. I was merely hoping to bring people an idea about life and about God, and mainly about who they are, that could lift them up and bring them to a higher experience than they've ever had before. Mm, higher self. Well, actually, uh, I read some things about automatic writing or psychography. It's claimed physics ability, allowing a person to produce written words without consciously writing. And um, now you will, of course, confirm me now, that or not regarding conversations with God. Did it happen to you? Um, because it's actually channeling writing through some higher self or actually through your higher soul. You know, I, I stay away from the word channeling because mm. I don't want anyone to ever think that Neil Donald Walsh thinks he's channeling God. Mm. Mm. Uh, that would be a very a, a dangerous thing for me to... Uh, for me to suggest. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think I'm channeling God any more than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were channeling Jesus or channeling God. But I do think that I listen very carefully to what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I simply, I'm just a messenger. I just take dictation. What I am is I'm a very good secretary. I take secretary dictation. Of God. You know, okay. I, I made me write a book one day, God's <laughs> Personal Secretary, because I simply ask a question and then the answer immediately comes to me. I don't question what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. I simply mm -hmm. write down the answer mm -hmm. like one is taking dictation. But I wouldn't call it channeling. Uh, I think guidance. it's inspired. I call it inspired writing. You know, God said something very interesting to me. She mm -hmm. said, I talk to everybody all the time. The question is not to whom am I talking? The question is, 
who's listening. Exactly. And through different forms, you many times said, not only through words, it can be signs, songs, lyrics. Feelings. Feelings. A simple feeling. We've all walked into a place of business and we get two feet into the room and we turn around and say, no, no, and we don't even know why. We just turn around and walk back not out. Good for me. Mm. Whether it's a restaurant or whatever it is, we say, no, this isn't the place. And so uh, we have that ability to be open to the messages from the divine in uh, many, many different forms. All we have to do is listen and pay attention and then don't disagree. Follow that fundamental message that you will receive if you're open to it. Okay, so that's a great actually message for all of our viewers. If you do have something that's coming from within you, you can just write down the question and maybe just try to be in a relaxed state of being and see what will come from that. Well, what I, what I invite people to do is to do what I call the overnight trick. I invite mm -hmm. them to go to sleep, uh, before they go to sleep, have a pad and pencil next to their nightstand and write down the qu question that's really bothering them, mm -hmm. the question that re they're really looking at right now. Just write the question, put the pencil down, down and go to sleep and when you wake up in the morning before you do anything even almost even before you get out of bed reach for the pencil take the tablet and write the first thing that comes to your to mind, mind without thinking about it don't let yourself think about it just write the first thing read the question and write the first thing that comes to your mind mm -hmm. people have astonished themselves with that process mm -hmm. because they go oh my god they did drop literally drop the pen oh my gosh this there, is it there it is the right, right is there, there. Often it's an answer that they've already thought of but have rejected because it seemed too good to be true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I know much of what I was told in conversations with God seemed too good to be true. We're underestimating ourselves so Everything. many times. And we're underestimating ourselves, we're underestimating the universe, we're underestimating the essence that we call God, we're underestimating the purpose of, and the function of life. We're, and it's understandable because we're mm. a very young species. Oh yes. We're just, mm. a, we're just, we're just, we are the toddlers of the universe. And so we really don't understand what's, what's going, going on what's here, going on 98 percent of our time. The other thing that many young people are approaching me uh, to ask you as well is like, can you give advice to young people who are completely lost in this spiritual theoretical uh, practice, but they're so unexperienced in practice, real practice, because they read thousands of the book, self-help books, it's a new age theory, you know, and they're completely lost how should they proceed, because they have lots of theory but zero practice. So well, I can give them actual tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, the advice I would give them is to simply ask yourself some fundamental questions in, in, in life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and questions like this. If I was a young person, 16 or 18 or 19 or 20, and just moving into my adult years, I would begin to ask myself, number one, who am I? Who am I really? What is the essence of who I am? Am I simply a physical entity, mm -hmm. like a mammal, like a, a dolphin or a whale or a bird in the sky, and that's it, that's all I am? Or is it possible that I'm an actual spiritual entity that simply has a body mm -hmm. and has a mind? Mm -hmm. If, and if that young person says, well, you know, I do think I have a soul, I do think I'm a spiritual entity, but I don't know how to make that work, then I would say to them, the first step is to acknowledge that you are that. Mm -hmm. Then to begin to ask yourself a question, if I really am that, if this body is something I have, but not something that I am, then why? Why, why? do I have this tool? Mm -hmm. And what is the best way that I can use this tool? Or, or to, you know, the question I ask myself almost all day long, I keep on asking myself the same question. What does what's going on right now, whether I'm eating, whether I'm dancing, whether I'm chatting with someone or having a television interview, what does this have to do with the agenda of my, my soul? soul. Mm. And if I can't see the connection, if I can't see any, anything that it has to do with the agenda of my soul, I don't do it. I simply say no, mm. I don't do it. But first of all, they need to understand what, what the agenda, agenda what of the this agenda soul, soul is. is. Yeah. So they can uh, go to plus or minus toward that. And the agenda of the soul, as I understand it, is a twofold, evo in one word, evolution. evolution. The agenda of the soul is for us to evolve, to become grander and grander versions of who we already are, so that we might know and experience, express and become what divinity has had in mind for us from the very beginning that we might become 
a living, walking, breathing experience of divinity itself. That's a very dangerous thing for people to believe and for some people to say. Very but every, every mm. great spiritual master has said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And look what happened to them. Yes. Mm. Yes, because if you think that your life here is what's the most important thing, you will think that they had a tragic ending. But if you realize, oh, wait a minute, actually, not only did they not have a tragic ending, their ending, which we call tragic, actually changed the world. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? God asked me a very interesting question once. She said to me, Neil, I know you think that dying is a really sad thing to happen to you, but supposing I told you that the way and the manner in which you died would change the lives of 500,000 people in a positive way, would you do it? And my answer was, well, actually, with, if, yes. Yeah. If I thought that I could help half a million people have a happier, more joyful experience of life, and all I had to do to produce that outcome was to die, mm -hmm. yes, I would do it. Mm -hmm. And you see, it's the burning building. Mm -hmm. you, you would go in to, just to save one. Forget about half a million. Yeah. You go into the building just, just to save one. To Let's hope that many people would, say, would answer the same thing that you answered, because I'm afraid that some people would say, no. Wait, but they would say no unless they understood that life goes on forever. Yes. If they thought that this is the only life you have, they might say, no, I can't give up this. Mm -hmm. But if they realize, wait a minute, this is just one of many, many thousands of lifetimes I've already had, and one of many thousands that I'm still going to have. So it's, it's, it's not a question of how much longer I'm going to live in this body, but how. How? How am I going to live and what will my life stand for? Mm -hmm. And if, if, if the worst that was said about me was that he died in a way that saved half a million people, I can live with that. I will go for that. I can, I can live with that. Yeah, many times you said be a demonstration, a set an example, try to lead by an example, try to live your life so you can shine light on many people as possible, right? So they can follow you. Well, not follow you, not that they can follow me. Mm. See, a, a leader is not one who says, follow me. A leader is one who says, I'll go first. Mm. Think of what being a leader really means. Leaders, true leaders don't say, follow me. True leaders say, I'll go first. Mm. I'll be the first out there. You don't have to worry about it. There's, I'll go first. There is a similar sentence, I think, in conversations with God when you said the true master is not the one who has many students, but the true master is the one who creates made, many teachers. Create many masters and many teachers, yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's about uh, God invited me uh, to give people back to themselves. That was really the message. Change the world's mind about God, give people back to themselves. That is, cause them to know who they really are and inspire them and ignite them so that they decide to actually live that way and that would change the world mm. and then awaken the species the is third it the conversation, and last invitation the last one is it number four is it correct which happened book number four recently yeah. so you you got another message yeah awaken the species awaken the species do whatever there. it takes to awaken humanity to its true identity and its true purpose, and the true purpose of life everywhere mm -hmm. in, in, in the entire universe. What is the purpose and function of life? And the purpose and function of life throughout the universe is to be a living, breathing representation that is a representation of divinity itself, that, that, that God might know itself in, as, and through us.
You know, God said something very interesting to me. She mm -hmm. said, I talk to everybody all the time. The question is not, to whom am I talking? The question is, who's listening? Exactly. And through different forms, you many times said, not only through words, it can be signs, songs, lyrics. Feelings. Feelings. A simple feeling. We've all walked into a place of business, and we get two feet into the room, and we turn around and say, no, no, and we don't even know why. We just turn around and walk back not out. Good for me. Mm. Whether it's a restaurant or whatever it is, we say, no, this isn't the place. And so uh, we have that ability to be open to the messages from the divine in uh, many, many different forms. All we have to do is listen and pay attention and then don't disagree. Follow that fundamental message that you will receive if you're open to it. Okay, so that's a great, actually, message for all of our viewers. If you do have something that's coming from within you, you can just write down the question and maybe just try to be in a relaxed state of being and see what will come from that. Well, what I, what I invite people to do is to do what I call the overnight trick. I invite mm -hmm. them to go to sleep, uh, before they go to sleep, have a pad and pencil next to their nightstand and write down the qu question that's really bothering them, mm -hmm. the question that re they're really looking at right now. Just write the question, put the pencil down, down and go to sleep. And when you wake up in the morning before you do anything, even almost even before you get out of bed, reach for the pencil, take the tablet and write the first thing that comes to your to mind. mind without thinking about it. Don't let yourself think about it. Just write the first thing. Read the question and write the first thing that comes to your mind. Mm. People have astonished themselves with that process mm -hmm. because they go, oh my God, they drop, literally drop the pen. Oh my gosh. This there, is it. There it is. The answer right, right is there. there. Often it's an answer that they've already thought of but have rejected because it seemed too good to be true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I know much of what I was told in conversations with God seemed too good to be true. We're underestimating ourselves so Everything. many times. And we're underestimating ourselves. We're underestimating the universe. We're underestimating the essence that we call God. We're underestimating the purpose of, and the function of life. We're, and it's understandable because we're mm. a very young species. Oh, yes. We're mm. just, a, we're just, we're just, we are the toddlers of the universe. And so we really don't understand what's, what's going, going on what's here. What's going on 98 here. 98 of our time. The other thing that many young people are approaching me uh, to ask you as well is like, can you give advice to young people who are completely lost in this spiritual theoretical uh, practice, but they're so unexperienced in practice, real practice, because they read thousands of the book, self-help books. It's a new age theory, you know, and they're completely lost. How should they proceed? Because they have lots of theory, but zero practice. So well, I can give them actual tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, the advice I would give them is to simply ask yourself some fundamental questions in, in, in life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and the questions like this. If I was a young person, 16 or 18 or 19 or 20, and just moving into my adult years, I would begin to ask myself, number one, who am I? Who am I really? What is the essence of who I am? Am I simply a physical entity, mm -hmm. like a mammal, like a, a dolphin or a whale or a bird in the sky, and that's it, that's all I am? Or is it possible that I'm an actual spiritual entity that simply has a body mm -hmm. and has a mind? Mm -hmm. If, and if that young person says, well, you know, I do think I have a soul, I do think I'm a spiritual entity, but I don't know how to make that work, then I would say to them, the first step is to acknowledge that you are that. Mm -hmm. Then to begin to ask yourself a question, if I really am that, if this body is something I have, but not something that I am, then why? Why, why? do I have this tool? Mm -hmm. And what is the best way that I can use this tool? Or, or to, you know, the question I ask myself almost all day long, I keep on asking myself the same question. What does what's going on right now, whether I'm eating, whether I'm dancing, whether I'm chatting with someone or having a television interview, what does this have to do with the agenda of my, my soul? soul. Mm. And if I can't see the connection, if I can't see any, anything that it has to do with the agenda of my soul, I don't do it. I simply say no, mm. I don't do it. But first of all, they need to understand what, what the agenda, agenda what of the this agenda soul, soul is. is. Yeah. So they can uh, go to plus or minus toward that. And the agenda of the soul, as I understand it, is a twofold. Evo in one word, evolution. evolution. The agenda of the soul is for us to evolve, to become grander and grander versions of who we already are. 
so that we might know and experience, express and become what divinity has had in mind for us from the very beginning. That we might become a living, walking, breathing experience of divinity itself. That's a very dangerous thing for people to believe and for some people to say. Very but every, every mm. great spiritual master has said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And look what happened to them. Yes. Mm. Yes, because if you think that your life here is what's the most important thing, you will think that they had a tragic ending. But if you realize, oh, wait a minute, actually, not only did they not have a tragic ending, their ending, which we call tragic, actually changed the world. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? God asked me a very interesting question once. She said to me, Neil, I know you think that dying is a really sad thing to happen to you, but supposing I told you that the way and the manner in which you died would change the lives of 500,000 people in a positive way, would you do it? And my answer was, well, actually, with, if, yes. Yeah. If I thought that I could help half a million people have a happier, more joyful experience of life, and all I had to do to produce that outcome was to die, mm -hmm. yes, I would do it. Mm -hmm. And you see, it's the burning building. Mm -hmm. you, you would go into just to save one. Forget about half a million. Yeah. You go into the building just, just to save one. To Let's hope that many people would say would answer the same thing that you answered, because I am afraid that some people would say no. Wait, but they would say no unless they understood that life goes on forever. Yes. If they thought that this is the only life you have, they might say, no, I can't give up this. Mm -hmm. But if they realize, wait a minute, this is just one of many, many thousands of lifetimes I've already had, and one of many thousands that I'm still going to have. So it's, it's, it's not a question of how much longer I'm going to live in this body, but how. How? How am I going to live and what will my life stand for? Mm -hmm. And if, if, if the worst that was said about me was that he died in a way that saved half a million people, I can live with that. I will go for that. I can, I can live with that. Yeah, many times you said be a demonstration, a set an example, try to lead by an example, try to live your life so you can shine light on many people as possible, right? So they can follow you. Well, not follow you, not that they can follow me. Mm. See, a, a leader is not one who says, follow me. A leader is one who says, I'll go first. Mm. Think of what being a leader really means. Leaders, true leaders don't say, follow me. True leaders say, I'll go first. Mm. I'll be the first out there. You don't have to worry about it. There's, I'll go first. There is a similar sentence, I think, in conversations with God when you said the true master is not the one who has many students, but the true master is the one who creates made, many teachers. Create many masters and many teachers, yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's about uh, God invited me uh, to give people back to themselves. That was really the message. Change the world's mind about God, give people back to themselves. That is, cause them to know who they really are and inspire them and ignite them so that they decide to actually live that way and that would change the world mm. and then awaken the species the is third it the and last invitation the last one is it number four is it correct which happened book number four recently yeah. so you you got another message yeah awaken the species awaken the species do whatever there. it takes to awaken humanity to its true identity and its true purpose and the true purpose of life everywhere mm -hmm. in, in, in the entire universe. What is the purpose and function of life? And the purpose and function of life throughout the universe is to be a living, breathing representation that is a representation of divinity itself, that, that, that God might know itself in, as, and through us. Mm -hmm. I think it's the most important question, like you said earlier, uh, what's the world's biggest um, issue or problem or uh, challenge currently going on? The biggest problem in the world today, in my opinion and in my observation, the biggest problem in the world today is that the world does not know what the biggest problem is. The world sees the effect of the problem. They see the outcome of the problem but they don't understand what's causing the outcome. Now, you know you've got a big problem when you see the effect of it, but you don't know what's causing it. Mm -hmm. The effect that we're seeing is alienation. Mm. 
We are seeing a world that's more alienated to today than I've ever seen it in my lifetime. We've suddenly found finding ourselves in an us versus them world. Mm -hmm. They're the cause. They're the challenge. They're the difficulty. They're the ones that if only they would stop being the way they are, our problems would mm -hmm. go away. Mm -hmm. It's the immigrants or it's the gays or it's the straights or it's the conservatives or it's the liberals or it's the blacks or it's the whites. It's, it's the men. The it's, the, it's, it's, it's whoever is out there that's you know, the other, other mm -hmm. then. And so... But we don't know why we're so alienated. We, but we are, we are seeing alienation is tearing at the fabric of humanity's unity. More and more and more and more. And, and so and we are seeing the outcomes of that in our societal challenges, in our social uh, difficulties, all over uh, Europe, all over America, really all over the, all all over the, the world. world. Mm -hmm. But we don't know why. Now, what's causing this yeah. alienation? Why are we acting the way we're acting? Because we, 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 and we keep trying to solve the problem, Naida, at every level except the level at which the problem exists. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. There are people in the world who really mean well, and they're trying to solve the problems. But we keep trying to solve humanity's biggest problem at every level except the level at which the problem exists. We try to solve it as if it was a political problem. We use politics, but it doesn't work. It may put a Band-Aid for a few months or a few years, but the problem is returned. Then we say, oh, it's not a, it's not a political problem. It's, it's, it's an economic problem. We'll throw money at it. Uh. Or, or better yet, we'll withhold money from it, like sanctions, mm -hmm. and we'll get them We'll, we'll manipulate the currency, and that's how we'll solve the problem. That doesn't work either. Then we say, okay, it's not a political problem, it's not an economic problem, it's a, it's a military problem. <laughs> we'll drop bombs on it. We'll get them to do what we want. We'll drop bombs on it. We'll send missiles at them. One way or the other, we're going to get what we want and change this world for the better. And we actually think that we're changing the world for the better. That's what allows people to actually send missiles and drop bombs. To use force. Because yeah. they think that yeah. in the end it'll be for the better. Mm. So we keep trying to solve the world's problems at every level except the level at which the problem really exists. The world's problem is not a political problem. It's not an economic problem. And it's certainly not a military it's problem. Exactly. The so, problem in the world today is a spiritual problem. There we go. It has to do with what we believe about each other, about life, and about the thing that some people call God. And it can only be solved by spiritual means. When we finally understand that, we will have found the key that can unlock the door that and, throws and open... Suffering. Mm. Yes, and, and end the suffering of humanity. So the problem in the world today is a spiritual problem, and it has to do with what we believe. Until we change our beliefs, we will not change our behaviors, because beliefs create behaviors, and we are failing to see that. And we are refusing to change our beliefs, because to change our beliefs, you know, rocks the boat, and we don't so want to do that. We need to change our identity. We need, we need to rock our core. Yes. And it's we, have to, very we have to come up with a whole new hard. idea about who we are, mm -hmm. where we are, why we are here, and what is the purpose of all of it. And no major world political leader, or even any world spiritual leader, has had the courage to, to, to invite human mm -hmm. beings to ask a simple question. Is it possible, just possible, that there's something we don't fully understand here about God and about life, the understanding of which would change everything. That's the question that I bring before humanity, and I dare humanity to answer it. I think it really is up to uh, each individual to say, I choose to be an exemplar. I choose to be a model. Mm -hmm. I choose to be one who expresses what it's like to be a new human. And I'm going to do it, not just when I'm doing my work, like the technicians here, but when I leave here and I'm just in the restaurant or walking through the hallway at the hotel or saying goodbye to somebody, I'm going to make sure that no one who touches my life does not, uh, fails to receive a gift from me. What is the gift that I can give that person? A smile. Is something as small as that can re-establish another person's sense of who they are, and they can love themselves again. Mm -hmm. 
You know, mm -hmm. wow, that guy just gave me a wonderful, warm handshake, a wonderful smile. He, you know, he just re-established my faith in life and in other people. One more thing which is very interesting to me is the law of opposites. During the seminar, you mentioned that, and I wrote it, and I was very focused on that because I was very intrigued by that. Can you elaborate a bit more? Sure. Be because I'm still a bit puzzled, you know, because it's connected to this chaotic world and this high-speed acceleration of the consciousness. And yeah, good that you're seeing that because there is an increase in the speed of consciousness. That is, that is, there's an increase in the vibratory rate of the mm -hmm. energy of life itself. Yes. And that that increase is called evolution. That that's what happens when entire civilizations begin to grow and mature and become more and more evolved. Mm -hmm. Because the more evolved you are, the 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 the, the, the more profoundly you are impacting the vibratory frequency of of. Um, of the energy itself, the mm -hmm. energy of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, he, but uh, the law of opposites tells us that the moment you declare yourself to be anything, everything unlike it comes into the space of your life. It doesn't necessarily have to be in your own home, in your own backyard, in your own uh, nation or city or state, or, uh, uh, or in your own house, uh, but it can be in your awareness. It's, mm -hmm. You suddenly become aware, oh, the opposite of that exists somewhere, and there's a reason for that. Okay. Because in the absence of the opposite of what you are declaring, what you are declaring can't be experienced. And the, uh, the example that I like to use all the time is if I say, I am the light. You know, supposing I have the nerve to say, I am the light of the world. Somebody once actually said that. You know, I am the light of the world. Supposing that I thought I am the light of the world, not in an egotistical way, but just simply as a, as a way of, of, of confirming what I think I'm doing here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. I'm a flashlight. I, I'm the light of the world. I'm showing the way. So that every, and I'm going to go first. I'm going to go through the darkness first. A leader is not the one who says, follow me. A leader is the one who says, I'll, I'll go, go first. first. Mm. So if, the da if there's any danger out there, I will confront the danger. I will go first. So now, but in order for me to be the light, there would have to be darkness. Because if there's no darkness, there's no reason to be the light. The contrast. Mm. I can't experience the light. I can't experience being the light. Mm -hmm. So if I want to experience being the light, I would have to experience or at least know about that there is a thing called the darkness. So in the absence of darkness, it, that is, if everything was the light, if it was light, light everywhere, 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 mm -hmm. and no darkness anywhere, then I could not experience being the light. Being the light would then be a concept, but not an experience. Mm -hmm. I could conceptually understand that I'm the light, but I couldn't express myself as that. In order to express myself as the light, I would require the darkness. I would require it so grandly that I would actually call it forth. I will call it into my experience in order that I might be the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Is it the same thing with enemies? You remember that you quoted that many times. Do not say bad things about your enemies. I don't know. Love, love your enemies. Exactly. And bless those who persecute you. And be a light unto the darkness that you might know who you really are. Raise not your fist to heaven and curse the darkness not. But be a light unto the darkness that you might know who you really are. Mm. People who act in that way change the world. Indeed. One more topic is fear, because uh, I think we are living in a world which is driven by fear, and our primary emotion is fear, unfortunately. Yeah, well, because fear suggests there's something we have to lose. But yes. supposing you didn't have anything to lose. Mm -hmm. But we need to get to that state where well, are we not going to be afraid. Well, you know, you know, I use my life as, my, as proof. You mm. know, all the things that I was afraid of in my life, many of them actually happened. You know, I lived the great American nightmare. I, I wound up living on the street, living on the sidewalk for a year. So you, you can't tell me about fear because all the things that I was afraid of except dying, and I almost died a couple of times as well. Mm. I've had open heart surgery. I've had other instances. Where I have You've a, broken I've, your neck. I had broke my yeah. neck. I had a person put a live gun right to my face, you know, over here, you know, a, a loaded gun, you know, and I've, I've been in those situations where, oh, I see this could be the end of it right here. Mm -hmm. you know, so when you've been through those kinds of situations, but here I am. See, I'm still here. So I've used my life as a wonderful example of the things I was afraid of 
never actually happened. Mm -hmm. So fear is, somebody said, use fear as an acronym, as an abbreviation, F-E-A-R, feeling excited and ready. Mm -hmm. So, okay, adrenaline, excitement. Yeah. We could replace those words. God I'm afraid me, of maybe, or I'm excited about something. And God said to me, call your fears adventure. Adventure. Now, now she, she didn't say, don't be afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. See, is, is it, you know, I, I don't think it's a good idea to deny your fear and pretend you're not afraid of anything. Oh, that could be completely I, I think it would, it would not be a good idea exactly. because, n number one, it would be denying a, a, a feeling you genuinely have. Oblivion. Mm. But allow yourself to acknowledge that you're afraid of what you're afraid of. But then notice that even if that did happen, it would not be the end of you. You'd be okay. Unless it were the end of you, in which case that'd be okay also. Which is okay, that, because that, life that, is forever. That would be okay also. <laughs> so you need to break down your fears until the worst one, which will eventually never happen, of course. So, and not to reject them, maybe. Not to reject your fears, because most people are rejecting them. They're not embracing them. No, no. They're running fears, away no. from them. Call your fears adventure. Mm. Call your fears adventure. Step into it. Let's see how this is going to turn out. Gee, I wonder how this is going to turn out. And then you go ahead and, and play play the game. Play the game, because life is a game. That's wonderful. It's a joyous, joyous experience that can be grander than any one of us could have ever imagined if we simply knew who we really are and knew who everyone else really is. To respect the other. Yeah. So, and, that, and yes, to respect the other. And it really, honestly, it goes past respect. It goes to simply, I see you. Mm -hmm. I see your artistry, I see your creativity, I see you. Wow, and the world's a better place because you're here. The world is a better place because you're here. And when you can give that gift to everyone whose life you touch. Wow. I think we're coming to an end of this beautiful conversation. I think that we can go on forever. At least I would love to, but I think that television will not support that. I want to say to you, my message to you is don't let anyone discourage you by making you think you're getting, oh, you're getting awfully big for you big headed or whatever. No, no, no. You'll, you'll, you'll find a way to be as magnificent as you are with humility and compassion for others. And keep doing what you're doing because you're touching the world in a very, very important way. Thank you so much for conversation. And thank you for existing. And thank you for never letting go the important mission you're doing. Thank you for saying those kind things to me. It was nice to hear that. And I promise you that I'm not going to, I'm not going to let go at Please all. Please do. And re <laughs> reincarnate, incarnate thousands more times. Please do. <laughs> we will see each other in the next life. Good, fair enough. <laughs> With, it's a date. I see you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.